Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our Facebook Live presentation via Zoom. So uh, it's a pleasure to have everybody here. I'm just going to do a brief introduction. So my name is Srinivas Bishu. I'm one of the attending ideologists at the University of Michigan based in Ann Arbor in the United States. Um, I have with me uh, Dr. Kochar, who is also based in the United States at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh, uh, patient advocate Tina, and then our guest of honor, Dr. Ajit Sood. Um, and we're going to have a little discussion about J pouches and surgeries and medications and kind of what leads to a J pouch and potential complications that can happen out of a J pouch. Um, and, you know, as we as we go along, this is also being streamed on Facebook Live and also there's going to be some live tweeting and things like that. So to begin with, um, I'm just going to ask people to do like a very brief introduction of themselves. So Tina, I'm going to start with you and then you, Dr. Kochar, and then Dr. Sood, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Dr. Bishu. Um, and thank you, uh, Drs. Kochar and Dr. Sood for being here today. Um, uh, my name is Tina Swani Om Prakash, um, and this is part of uh, South Asian IBD Alliance's uh, professional uh, development series. Um, we're really excited to have you all here today. I myself am a Crohn's disease patient and patient advocate based out of New York City um, in the US. Um, I've had Crohn's for 16 years. I've uh, lived with a J pouch for six of those years. And unfortunately that J pouch did not work out. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that. Um, and I live with a permanent ileostomy today and I'm healthier and owning my Crohn's as ever. Um, Dr. Kochar, if you don't mind introducing yourself. <clears throat> yes, thank you so much, Tina. And thank you to the team of SIA for having me. It's an honor to be alongside you guys and my you know, mentor from med school, Dr. Sood. So my name is Gursimran Kochar. I'm currently the Associate Division Chief for the Division of Gastroenterology Hepatology at Allegheny Health Network. I also am the Director for Information Endoscopy and my interests include IBD, managing um, complications of IBD endoscopically, and obviously, you know, J pouches. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Sood, if you don't Dr. Sood, if you don't yeah. mind it. My name is Dr. Ajit Sood. I'm a professor and head of gastroenterology, and uh, I work at a place called as Budhiana, and uh, this is a very industrial town, so we call it as Louisiana. So here, this is a place where you can only work. So, I mean, uh, we are a busy center and we have a special interest in uh, IBD. We started an organization uh, named as Colitis Crohn's Foundation India in 2007. So since then, we are uh, working for IBD patients uh, in, in our country. And at the moment, we're lucky that uh, there have come up many other centers in the country. So at the moment, we have a good team working on IPD in the country. Thank you for asking me to join today's meeting. Thank you, Tina, and thank you, Vishu. Thank you, Dr. Sood. And just for the patients out there, Dr. Sood is being uh, somewhat modest. He's, he's one of the people that put IBD on the map in India. So he's a very, very important person with a lot of important contributions. Um, so let's, with that, let's start off with Dr. Sood. So Dr. Sood, I was hoping you would explain um, kind of the basics of what a J pouch is and how a patient ends up with the J pouch uh, and specifically, you know, Crohn's versus UC, if you don't mind. Sure. I'll start with the symptomatology that patients with uh, IBD, the major problem is the bowel control. And uh, most of the patients, we know that they respond to the medical therapy but around 10 to 15% of the patients, they reach at a stage where the drugs don't work or they have a side effects. So then there's a question that whether we should really take, take out the gut of a patient because it's not uh, working. And uh, so the question is that when we're going to remove the intestine, what are we going to end up with? Most of the patients, they, they know about that they have to be put on a bag. That is what we, that is what is popularly called in our country that they, they refer stoma to as having a bag in the tummy. Somehow there is a taboo. I mean, stoma or bag is not easily accepted in our country. And uh, I, I, I guess word over. So to overcome this problem, I mean, the, the surgeons thought that there should be some procedure which can result in continuity. And so that's how the concept of restorative proctocolectomy came. And uh, so that this, in this 
pouch, J pouch, uh, nastomosis is made of the small intestine with inner canal. So, so, so to make this anastomosis, I'm in the different ways. I mean, J pouch is, is labeled because it's the pouch, what is, what is made is a J shaped. There are other forms of uh, pouches like S pouch, which is other, other uh, form of uh, pouch, but J pouch remains the commonest. So by J pouch, it, we, we maintain the continuity of the gut. Person has a control over the bowel movements. So this helps in, in, uh, uh, in living a better quality of life as compared to just being on a stoma. So this is in, in nutshell, if, you, if I could put it in the right words. Perfect, perfect. Now, um, as you mentioned, there is a stigma associated with having an ostomy and having your colon removed, and it's a very permanent thing. And a lot of patients in the United States you know, face that same sort of, uh, I'm gonna call it mental trauma. Um, I was wondering, Tina, since you've actually gone through this, I was wondering if you could sort of describe maybe some of the feelings that you had when this decision was put to you. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Bishu. So, you know, um, my uh, I was initially diagnosed with ulcerative colitis um, in 2006. And what had happened is within two years, it got pretty um, significant. Um, I had to be ramped up from um, uh, mesalamines over to... Uh, prednisone and then uh, 6-MP, which is uh, similar to azathioprine, and uh, straight to Remicade, also known as infliximab. Nothing worked. Um, I, uh, you know, I think Remicade worked for about a week. And I remember there was so much pushback um, from my family even to try the biologics. And when my doctor started saying, look, Tina, I think you need surgery. Um, you know, my father had an ostomy as well. My aunt in New Delhi had an ostomy as well. Um, this is running in my family. My mom was traumatized from my dad's experience, which was 30 years ago with an ostomy. And um, alongside that, you know, some elders in my family, both in India and here in the US were like, Tina, you're 24 years old. You can't get an ostomy, you can't get a bag. Um, the, who's going to marry you? And I was um, seeing my now husband back then, we were dating, and um, even his family was like, oh my God, you're going to get a bag? Like, and they were telling Anand, you know, maybe she's not the person for you. So this was um, affecting me on so many levels um, with regards to my family, the elders, um, uh, soon to be in laws, like, how is this going to work out? You know, in our, in our culture, this is very much taboo, even um, abroad, you know, for those of us born and raised um, in the US or UK, Australia, we hear it all the time, um, that this is uh, not acceptable, this is unhygienic, it might smell, it's, it's not a way for um, you know, a young woman, or even a young man um, to be living. Um, and certainly, you know, puts into question our ability to um, get married, to work, and all those things. So it was, um, it was very challenging for me to surmount this, but I was so incredibly sick. And honestly, my surgery was several months delayed. I went into emergency surgery. I was really afraid no one in my family was going to take care of me. Um, Anand then a friend of mine took me to the hospital emergency room. My family was still against it. I said, just take the colon out. I cannot live like this anymore. Um, going 30, 40 times a day, I'm vomiting several times a day. I was um, down to, I think, 37 kilos um, um, from about 59 uh, kilos. And I'm about five, six. So you can imagine what a toll this was taking on me. and um, Still, my family was so against it, even after the, the surgery. And I was very, very worried about who was going to take care of me and how I would come out of this. My family has since come around. They've been extremely supportive. I think my family has also seen how, how much quality of life the ostomy gave me back. And, um, uh, you know, just going into J pouch surgery even um, was very, very challenging for me. Um, I ended up reversing the ostomy, which I actually preferred because my family was saying, Tina, uh, you, if you want to get married, you really need to go for the J pouch. So just to corroborate everything Dr. Sood just said, 
Uh, the J pouch really is an option to avoid that stigma. And I took that route, I went that route because um, there was so much pushback against the bag. Just to summarize, thanks a lot, Tina, for sharing your experience. Um, just, just to summarize for people listening out there, it, as Dr. Sood said, um, generally we, we refer people for a J pouch or total colectomy with an eventual J pouch when they have colonic inflammatory bowel disease, typically ulcerative colitis, sometimes Crohn's colitis, um, and they have either failed medications or for whatever reason do not want to have any medications or just have very um, what we call acute refractory disease. So that's somebody who just has to immediately come into the hospital and has a colonic perforation or something like that. Um, the surgery itself is quite specialized and requires stages. And, and Dr. Kochar, I was wondering if you could just sort of walk people through what type of surgeon would do this, what type of volumes you think are important for a surgeon to be competent and exactly the time frame between these steps. Sure, yes. Um, so I think uh, uh, pouch surgery is definitely a very uh, highly specialized surgery, at least in the United States. This is done by colorectal surgeons who specialize in IBD patients. And even within subset of those surgeons, you have surgeons who are um, highly qualified for pouch surgeries. Now, J pouch surgery started somewhere in, I mean, it was, I think, first done in 1978. And since then, it has gone over various uh, techniques and revisions. Uh, and it still remains one of the most uh, challenging intra-abdominal surgeries. So when it comes to a J-pouch surgery in any ulcerative colitis patient, and we have to keep in mind that <clears throat> about 20 to 30% of patients with ulcerative colitis may lose their colon uh, at some stage of the disease. It might not just be because of inflammation. It might also be that they have um, uh, malignant reasons. They might have dysplastic lesions, uh, you know, with low-grade or high-grade dysplasias or, or even cancer. So even in those patients, we offer a J-pouch surgery. Depending on what is your clinical status, uh, J-pouch surgery traditionally has been done in either a two-stage procedure or a three-stage procedure. It has been done in one stage, but I don't think so. That's a standard of care anywhere. Uh, <clears throat> what goes into a two-stage and three-stage, again, depends on your clinical condition, I personally, where I was trained, I, you know, kind of prefer a three-stage uh, procedure. Uh, in two-stage or three-stage, the main difference is that stage one is when you give a, a ileostomy to a patient and total colectomy. And in stage two, if you're doing a two-stage procedure, you will remove the rectum and then make the pouch from the ileum and attach it to the uh, remnant uh, uh, rectum or inner transition zone. In a three stage, you do this removal of rectum as stage two. And in the third stage, you bring them back and, and connect them. The advantages of three stage is that if you have a patient who was failing medical treatment, was hospitalized, or if someone came with toxic megacolon or someone had a perforation in those patients, three stage procedures help you to nutritionally optimize the patients, medically optimize the patient, or do everything in a controlled setting. Because given it's a highly skilled procedure, there can be both short-term and long-term complications. And in addition to the two and three stage, there are further two techniques of these surgeries. One is the, how do you make the anastomosis from the ileum to the anal canal? There is a technique in which you use the stapled anastomosis in which you use a stapler, and then there's a hand, uh, hand sewn uh, technique. Uh, I think between the two techniques, stapled anastomosis technique is most common, uh, more commonly preferred and, and more commonly done, uh, you know, versus the hand sewn technique. And we can go into the details, but <clears throat> it really depends on, again, what is the indication for your j pouch surgery, which technique to choose, um, you know, and some other technical factors. But from patient standpoint, a stapled anastomosis is, is good. They have more, more uh, you know, uh, continents of the ball with less leakage and things like that. So that's why, you know, understanding the nuances of this surgery are very important because you are creating a new, I always tell my patients, it's like creating a new organ. I'm taking your colon away. We are trying to create an ileum into something that it was not designed for. So you def that's why you need a very specialized surgeon uh, who has to look at all those things. And there are a lot of patient factors that go into it. For example, 
if you are <clears throat> morbidly obese, right? If your BMI is very high, then j surgery can be challenging. It's not an absolute contraindication, but it can be very challenging. There are other technical risk uh, factors. If you go in and <clears throat> you, know, you don't have too much of mesentery tissue left because of the inflammation, then the surgery can again be challenging because you have to pull the ileum down into the pelvis. So all these issues an experienced surgeon will keep in mind and, and you know, they will, they will proceed ahead with this. That's why I think it should be done in centers which are highly specialized, who have this experience, who do these surgeries very, very frequently um, and not like, you know, maybe, uh, you know, few, few cases a year. <clears throat> thank, you. thank you, Dr. Kochar. And um, I'm, I'm just going to summarize what you said um, for, for some patients in a way that I understand it anyway. I am going to stand up and show you guys on, my, on myself here. So the colon, sort of a backwards shaped U, all right, and the small intestine comes out over here on the right side. And a total colectomy is they remove all the colon but leave the rectum, which is just the bottom. Um, and the reason for doing that is because you want to be able to plug the intestine in. <clears throat> and a, a very simple way to think about why somebody would not do it all in one stage, um, which effectively means why somebody would need a, a bag for some temporary amount of time, has to do with how healthy the tissue is. So if the colon and the rectum are really, really inflamed, if you suture that small intestine right into the rectum as a one-stage procedure, which avoids a bag, there's a really high chance that that surgical anastomosis will rip apart. And if it rips apart, you get something called pelvic sepsis. And the pelvis is actually very, very, very deep. And pelvic sepsis, even in this day, has a really bad complication rate. Um, people can die from pelvic sepsis, but more importantly, even in cases where people don't die, that area can really scar and the, the bottom of the pelvis, like the bottom of the pelvis for men and women has a lot of nerves that come in. So that's really, really important to preserve that area. Um, so following up on what Dr. Kochar said, Dr. Sood, I imagine that you guys have specialized surgeons uh, in India at your center or people that, that, that do this. Do you mind um, maybe discussing some of that a little bit for patients in India who really aren't familiar with some of these things? Yeah, the IBD as a disease came first in Europe or uh, US. And uh, we have started seeing IBD more over the last 30 years or so. And though I mean in, in, in uh, Europe and US, IBD is there for the last 70 years or so. So that way, about IBD, regarding IBD, we are behind by 40, 50 years. So what is the scene in India at the moment is that we see IBD more frequently now, but even now, the severity of the disease is not as much as, as it's reported from your countries. The phenotype of the disease is same. I mean, we see ulcerative colitis as well as Crohn's, but Luckily, so far, I mean, so far, so good. The disease is very much there. It's not mild, but I'll say it is not as severe as it is from in Europe or the US. But my guess is we are not uh, going to escape this. It's, it's, it's the disease severity over time is becoming worse, you know. And to share with you, like I've been working in North India. So what we see at our center, then we see, we have started seeing a very, very severe ulcerative colitis. While in South, they have more of uh, Crohn's. They have ulcerative colitis, but ulcerative colitis is not as severe as we are used to seeing it at my place. So that way, we, more, we subject more patients to surgery at our place. So now with the, with the growth, I mean, the, there are good training centers for a gastroenterologist. There are good training centers for GI surgeons also. So there are surgeons who are picking up this as a, as a specialty and GI surgeons are not very difficult uh, surgeon to identify. We are, we are lucky that we have uh, three surgeons at the moment. And we're lucky that we have uh, paramedics also who can really, really take care of the patient. We have a stoma therapist who's, who's there to help us in handling in these patients. So, but even then, if you see that what percentages of patients of ulcerative colitis, they, they undergo pouch. In India, I will say even now, it's not more than 5%. So like Tina mentioned that her family took longer time to accept than she herself. 
same is the story here i mean the moment we say surgery the prompt the spontaneous response of the patient and the family is no no i am not going to undergo surgery for this you do whatever best medicines are available to you but we need a persuasion we need to explain a patient that the stage has come where surgery is inevitable so what happens in our country at the moment the major indication for surgery or the major chunk of patients who undergo surgery at the moment are as you mentioned patients who have acute severe refractory disease who got life threatening hemorrhage and, and we say that okay this this there's no other option but to undergo surgery while the other indication where patients need surgery is a chronic refractory kind of ulcerative colitis that's a group of patients who find it more difficult to accept surgery so for us 90% of our patients who undergo pouch surgery belong to the first category means acute severe ulcerative colitis who are bleeding so profusely and uh, their life is in danger and we we say that the salvage the salvage therapy whatever we have in hand has not worked so surgery is the last option and you have no other choice so that is the situation but it takes time and uh, with time more and more people are accepting and they recognize the value of surgery and it's it's not so difficult now to convince a patient as it used to be about say 15 years back or so so the scene is changing but slowly and slowly got it got it so um i as a i'm glad you brought that up because i think that's one of the the key concepts that you could help me understand as you pointed out in the united states and in the west um you know we are very very sub 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 specialized um and in fact e- even me and simran while we both do ibd we're actually in sort of different parts of IBD. Um, one of the things that I have noticed in India is that there are high volume centers with very talented people who are completely up to date on IBD management such as yourself, um, you know AIG obviously with Rupa Energy uh, and there are a variety of other centers Kiran Petty Vishal Sharma PGI but I don't know to what extent there is awareness among your general GI providers at major metropolitan and rural areas and among patients and I was wondering if you could comment on that a, a little bit and what resources patients would have if they're coming from one of those places. Yeah that that's very important you know we have reached a stage of uh, specialization we still are not at stage of sub 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 specialization now if you ask me how many colorectal surgeons are there in the country there may not be anyone I'm the big man. I mean, who's just doing colorectal surgery? So uh, that is true for gastroenterologist also. Now, if you ask me that, what is my area of interest? Given a choice, I would like to work only for IBD, but I can't afford because my working, my work uh, profile in the hospital is such that I can't refuse other patients. The hospital will not keep me if I say, okay, I'm not seeing any other patient, but working only on IBD. so that is a situation we have to treat kind of we need to be jack of all trade kind of a situation rather than really being focused only on one disease but that that's becoming more and more pertinent with coming time and i think in coming years i will opt to focus only to work only for patients with diabetes so Got there it. are so 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 in nutshell i'll say that we are still not very much there to have very very specialized surgeons working or very, or very specialized gastroenterologists working only for ibd but i can foresee that in coming decades i'm saying not in years coming decades maybe we we start having people who who are just focused on ibd got it got it and and, and that's and i want to remind people listening um that's dr sood saying that who like put sort of ibd on the map in india one of the critical people so if 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 he has to have a mixed practice just imagine what's happening at the local level at non major academic centers um and i think i i will tell you even in the united states even in places like michigan the level of sort of detail with these biologics and all that is is such that even our community providers are not necessarily specialized in in very very uh, high value ibd i'll i'll say um and with that i just want to segue to dr kochar so he can talk a little bit about exactly what his subspecialty is in in ibd um because it's it's quite unique and it has to do with how he's managed to put his training together coming from the cleveland clinic um dr kochar please go ahead yes um you know i did my gastroenterology fellowship at cleveland clinic and my mentor was dr boshan he is the quote unquote the pouch guru uh so we had a very good exposure to you know a pouch patient so i worked a lot with him so that's how i subspecialized you know in 
patients with J pouches. Uh, however, again, learning under him, I also now subspecialize to manage complications in IBD patients endoscopically, like structures, fistulas, leaks, abscesses, <clears throat> which traditionally require surgery. There is some subset of patients that we can help them endoscopically now to delay or avoid surgeries um, altogether. And uh, you know, I'm very happy to say we built a very good, what we call as interventional IBD center here at Allegheny Health Network in Pittsburgh. So jumping on that, I was hoping you could actually mention some of the common complications of the J pouch itself. Um, and I was hoping you could start with maybe just like plain old pouchitis, which is relatively right. common. Uh, and then touch on a little bit like what happens with ileitis and then the conversion of UC to Crohn's um, and then possibly strictures, which I know is your area of sort of expertise, please. Right. So yes, <clears throat> the actually also just for the, for the listeners, we actually recently formed a pouch, global pouch consortium and we have subsequently published a list of guidelines. And one of the guidelines uh, or consensus guidelines focused on uh, you know, various complications of pouch patients. So we can start with complications. So when we divide complications, we divide them into inflammatory complication, structural complications, and then structural mechanical, and then functional complications. So in inflammatory complications, you have your pouchitis that can be acute or chronic. Um, at least in US, about 45 to 47% of the patients will develop chronic pouchitis, which basically means that you have inflammation in your pouch. The mechanism of the same is not very well understood, but uh, a bacterial dysbiosis plays a very central role in uh, you know, having pouchitis. Uh, and we can segue later to the management. I'm just gonna stick to different uh, disorders of uh, pouch. So under the inflammatory disorders also is the Crohn's disease of the pouch. Now, traditionally in US, we have offered J pouches to patients with ulcerative colitis, or patients who have FAP, a genetic uh, you know, cancer risk uh, for colon cancer patients. Crohn's disease is now a relative indication, but still many surgeons do not offer J pouches for Crohn's disease. But about 10 to 12% of our patients who had just ulcerative colitis prior to the surgery can develop you know, mm -hmm. uh, Crohn's disease after a pouch surgery, especially a uh, you know, few years out of their pouch surgery. So that's another major complication that we have to manage like any other Crohn's disease. When we segue away from inflammatory complications to mechanical complications, you have your pouch strictures. Stricture is basically narrowing of the lumen. So I always tell my patients, imagine a drain pipe that's getting blocked. So it's getting narrowed. So strictures <clears throat> usually tend to happen at the inner transition zone where your anastomosis is, uh, or they end to uh, tend to happen at the uh, pouch inlet, which is basically the opening leading from the J pouch to your small intestine. There's a round opening uh, and that can get strictured down. Stricture can cause issues with you straining during the bowel movement, uh, having in incomplete you know, evacuation. It can also lead to more um, you know, fecal stasis, stool stays in the intestine longer, and that can cause whole lot of other issues like diarrhea and things like that because of bacterial overgrowth. The other mechanical complication, and this can be part of uh, inflammatory complication also is uh, fistulas. You know, fistulas can happen right after the surgery, as you were describing, if the anastomosis come off, if it doesn't completely rip off, but slightly rips off, you're going to have an, a fistula that goes into your back and what leads to what we call as a presacral abscess, uh, things of that nature. In the line of the fistula also is a pouch sinus. Basically the difference between a sinus and a fistula is, I explained to my patient, fistula is like putting a straw between two organs. There are two openings. Sinus is only one-sided opening. Uh, these are some of the mechanical complications that can happen. Now, if you have Crohn's disease of the pouch, you can develop fistulas from that as well and the pouch sinuses from that as well. Besides these mechanical complications, there is another set of complications known as functional complications. Just like you know, people can have functional irritable bowel syndrome on top of their IBD, they can have what we describe as irritable pouch you know, syndrome in which basically the pouch looks fine, either it is too dilated, uh, that leads to more bacterial overgrowth. They can develop issues with pouch prolapse. They can develop issues with a pouch of seal, just like on the lines of rectal seal in which the, the interior wall of the pouch kind of, you know, uh, invaginates. So <clears throat> these are some of the issues that we like to classify. So 
management of pouch patients after the surgery has been done is a multidisciplinary approach. You need the surgeon and a gastroenterologist trained to kind of figure it out what it is that's causing their patients issues because then the management completely changes. So just on this very line, if I can mention one thing, some of the patients have a concept that if they have ulcerative colitis and you take their colon out, then they are cured of the disease. I don't think so. That's quite true. Uh, that's the, you know, <clears throat> I sometimes get this question from patients a lot saying, if you take my colon out, am I cured? I think that's a misconception. Even if I, we were to give you end ileostomy, there are some patients who develop, you know, sometimes uh, enteritis and things like that. Uh, and as with the J pouch, you can have some issues. So I don't think so. We are there yet to say that we can cure your ulcerative colitis with a colectomy. Thank you very much. Um, so I think you hit on some several really, really important concepts. And I'm going to ask Tina to comment because I think she went through this as a, as a patient herself. Um, but some of the key concepts there are, you know, first of all, you can have inflammation of the pouch where you get like pouchitis that we think is due to bacteria that really aren't supposed to be there. And it gets back to what you said before, which is you're, you're creating a cavity that was never intended to sort of hold stool. So that's an important concept. Um, and then the other important concept is you can have damage to the pouch itself and cause a mechanical blockage, like think calcium in a pipe. Um, and then the third thing are other things having to do with the anastomosis or potential development of Crohn's. Now for everybody listening, that 10% of people that end up actually 10 to 20% of people where you think they have UC and then they have Crohn's are, are prone to develop these fistulas. And, and Tina herself mentioned that she went through the ileostomy pouch and then back to an ileostomy. And Tina, as you advertised, um, you have Crohn's. So I'm not sure if initially you were thought to have UC and then you had a pouch or, or if you were one of the Crohn's patients that actually had the pouch surgery, if you don't mind commenting on that. Sure, sure. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Please. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. I also wanted to emphasize this point that IBD after surgery is not a cure for IBD. That is why in a treatment paradigm, surgery is at the fag end. You know, even we we have to make it clear to our patients that even after surgery or even after making a pouch for uh, ulcerative colitis, there's no symptomatic relief right away. It takes a time, it takes approximately say a year or so for small intestine to adapt to take up the role of a large intestine. So till that time, number of stools are large. I mean, a person may be passing around 15 to 20 stools and there may be difficulty in controlling the bowels. So because of these limitations of surgery, that is why surgery is not the first choice. That's why we always say medicines, if not working, then we go for surgery. And you must have noticed the number of potential complications what Simran enumerated. I mean, that's why there's a very important that the surgeon who, who does it is, is that is why we emphasize again and again that it's the kind of surgery which should be done at high volume centers. Because person has to have a very good experience of uh, handling these patients. Yeah, I, I, thank you for, for, for yeah. bringing up those points. And I want to come back to you um, to deal with sort of pouchitis and where the new sort of treatments are going with the pouch itself, including a recent trial oh. on Antibio. But uh, yeah, Tina, Tina, sorry. Tina. Yeah, no, you're I'm fine. You're fine. Glad, I'm glad that you uh, stepped in and said that surgery is not a cure for inflammatory bowel disease. It's something that we tell our patients all the time. And I've also um, I was actually told um, it would be a cure for me. So this was heartbreaking when it wasn't before, um, you know, my takedown surgery. So I had technically a three-stage surgery, but I had a number of complications and they had to go in a fourth time to clear out some of the abscesses that I think Dr. Kochar was talking about. Um, uh, my surgery was very delayed, as I'd mentioned earlier, and because of that, I believe I had a number of complications. Um, now, between the second and third surgery, I started to develop um, what was uh, called pouchitis. It's an inflammation of the pouch. And um, I started having um, mucus and a lot of blood coming through my bottom um, in spite of having an ostomy. Um, there was still some mucus and blood coming through there. And perhaps um, Dr. Suter, Dr. Kochar, if you don't mind elaborating 
um, after I'm done um, about how sometimes there can be some discharge from the bottom even after surgery. Um, but I was having significant amounts of it. And at this time I told my surgeon, look, what's going on? And he's like, I think you might have um, what's known as pouchitis. And um, he put me on an antibiotic and he was like, Tina, I think, um, you know, let yourself heal and let's move forward with the pouch surgery um, with a takedown and, you know, reverse your ostomy and move forward with, you know, connecting the J pouch to that small portion of the rectum that's left behind the rectal cuff. I was like, are you sure we should go forward with this at this time? Um, you know, like I, I, is this something that's gonna keep happening to me, the pouchitis? And he's like, if it does, we will figure it out. You are a young woman, um, your family is really insistent. He was an Asian man, he got it. He understood, you know, why um, my family was pushing so hard for the J pouch. He's like, worst case, we will handle it. If it doesn't work out, there's a number of options. Um, it was 2009 at the time, and I went ahead reluctantly um, and had the takedown done in February 2009. Um, and uh, as soon as the takedown was done, I, with the stool passing through, um, with the plethora of bacteria sort of in the J pouch area, I started having a lot of inflammation. I was on antibiotics, so metronidazole and ciprofloxacin um, for several years, and um, I was rotated to rifaximin and also augmentin at times, amoxicillin at times. Um, so I was on uh, sort of uh, a chain of antibiotics, a uh, carousel of them, so to speak, um, for a few years, for five years or so. And then I started to develop fistulae. Um, so as Dr. Bishu was mentioning, it's like a straw. And this was very difficult for me. It went from my anastomosis site where the J pouch was connected to that rectal cuff straight into my lady parts, um, that straw, that fistula. Um, and I just wanna say it was extremely difficult to deal with. I had just gotten married and we thought, you know, have a J pouch, this is all gonna be fine. This is behind me. And here we are with a fistula. And it was one of the most difficult experiences um, as a woman to have this um, and it was, you know, I was starting to face a lot of pushback again from my in-laws like, and my husband was facing a lot of it too. Like you married her, what are you gonna do about this? So um, we did start uh, biologics again. Um, and I think maybe we can talk a little bit about management of J pouches that can have pouchitis and other complications. And there's uh, some questions coming in um, via Facebook that maybe we can bring up a little bit later on. Um, but uh, Dr. Sooth, if you don't mind going into a little bit on the management and Dr. Kochar, that would be amazing. Yeah. So like we've been using this word pouchitis. So I'll start with that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier that uh, after the J pouch, we have to pass it on to the patient that the number of stools are going to remain high for, a, for some time, at least for a year or so. Uh, how we suspect pouchitis that once a person becomes normal, if there's a sudden increase in the number of the stools with a lot of uh, passage of mucus, with the pain in the abdomen, low grade fever, anorexia, weight loss, these are some of the features which resemble when a person has active ulcerative colitis. So once these kind of symptoms appear, we suspect that the inflammation is setting in the pouch. Generally, pouchitis lacks passage of blood. So, so the other term is cuffitis. Like you mentioned that uh, there is a two to three centimeter uh, cuff or a rectal mucosa left inside. So there could be inflammation in that area as well. So we need to differentiate between cuffitis and uh, pouchitis because the treatment differs between the two. If somebody has passage of frank blood, it's, it's, it favors more of uh, cuffitis rather than pouchitis. The other complication which can happen as Simran mentioned that at times, what we label a patient as ulcerative colitis may turn out to be later on as Crohn's disease or indeterminate colitis initially may turn out to be Crohn's disease or rarely there could be de novo development of Crohn's disease in a, in a pouch or in the, in the efferent limb. So there could be development of Crohn's disease of the pouch also. So these are some of the 
things which can happen with the J pouch. And these conditions, the present, these conditions present with the diarrhea, and there could be passage of uh, blood and a lot of uh, mucus, and that is what really upsets a person. So, how we take care of pouchitis? It depends whether it's acute or chronic. Most of the time, the first drug is ciprofloxacin, as you also mentioned, that you were put on antibiotics for a long time. The other group of drugs is uh, is uh, probiotics. I mean, probiotics have more of a role of uh, in, in prophylaxis, and uh, we have to give uh, probiotics for a long term again. But we need to know that if a patient has an element of cofitis, then we have to add five and uh, five years again, or we need to go for a rectal therapy, what we have been using for uh, actual inflammatory bowel disease. We have to think of using drugs like uh, steroids or even uh, uh, biologic biologics if there is element of uh, inflammation. Before that, I will say that we should confirm with endoscopy that what is the scene inside, whether the inflammation in the pouch is, uh, is diffuse or whether it's uh, localized to one part of the pouch what is the what is the state of uh, efferent limb or the small bowel which has been connected to the pouch and uh, whether there are ulcers at the at the anastomotic site only because if there are ulcers only at the anastomotic site that doesn't indicate uh, active disease while if there is inflammation in the pouch which is diffuse it means there is a pouchitis while if the if there is a limited inflammation in the pouch it may actually be related to the to the surgery rather than the immune disease. So this is how we need to, we need to, you know, make a diagnosis that what is the person actually having. So we base a diagnosis on the clinical symptoms, endoscopy findings, and we take a biopsy also to rule out uh, infections. At times there could be infections in the, in the pouch mucosa, like uh, viral infections, cytomegala virus, or even C. diff can happen in the, uh, in the small bowel. So we look for enteric infections and we look for, uh, 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 you know, the degree and the kind of inflammation and uh, the kind of ulcers, what are there. If, if the whole of the small bowel is involved, means there's inflammation in the efferent limb. Efferent limb means the, the small intestine, which is being connected to the pouch. And uh, we try to reach up to the anastomotic site in the ileum, ileostomy site or we see if the whole of the small intestine is inflamed, we really consider a possibility of uh, Crohn's disease. Or, or there could be some kind of surgical ablations in the form in case if we feel the small, the ileum is angulated, we can't go up to that. Then again, these are anatomical aberrations which can happen after surgery. So we need to have more detailed workup to make up our mind. But for pouchitis, we start with antibiotics and probiotics and in case if it don't work, then we proceed on to the other drugs, what we've been using for uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Thank you, Dr. Sood. Dr. Kochar, do you want to pick up where Dr. Sood left off and talk about maybe some of the endoscopic approaches that you use for these structures? Yes. And Absolutely. I think Dr. Sood put it very eloquently, uh, the management. So uh, we do start with antibiotics. Uh, there will be a subset of patients which are antibiotic responsive you know, pouchitis, in which whenever we put them on antibiotics, they do well. Uh, there is a subset of patients we classify as antibiotic dependent, that they require antibiotic course throughout the year. And then there are patients who are antibiotic refractory, meaning they don't uh, respond to uh, routine antibiotics. And then those are the patients we move on to biologics. Now, uh, Dr. Sood very uh, correctly mentioned that endoscopy plays a very central role to this. We have to know the disease extent and we have to see if there are any other associated complications. Because if you have a stricture at the pouch uh, afferent limb uh, or the pouch inlet, then just giving the medications might not help the patient. We have to treat the stricture as well, uh, either with balloon dilatation or, you know, uh, what we do now is endoscopic stricture art, mean which we take a knife through the scope and cut the stricture open. Uh, so, since, again, if you have a pouch sinus, giving medications alone might not help. We have to do endoscopic sinusotomy. Um, I also routinely get MRI pelvis in my patients just so that I can make sure there is no abscess, like there is no leak. Uh, especially in the J pouch, the 
tip of the J is an area that can develop acute or chronic leaks. Uh, acute leaks are dealt with surgery, but chronic leaks require uh, management endoscopically or with surgery. Again, if you have a concurrent leak, giving the medications alone might not help patient symptoms. Uh, also fistulas. You can develop fistulas as Tina was suggesting between the pouch and the vagina or from the pouch outside to your buttocks or uh, intra-anal sphincter fistulas, or you can develop pouch body fistulas in which the fistula is internal in the pouch body. And if you have a pouch fistula, especially you know pouch body fistula, again, alone medications don't help. We have we can do endoscopic fistulotomies in these patients. We uh, you know we we, we can um, perform drainage of the abscesses in these patients. So I think you just have to make sure that you're not missing anything else out just with the inflammation. But I agree if a patient just has pouchitis, which can happen. Um, as I said, I said in a lot number of patients, you just start with the antibiotics. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Dr. Kochar. I apologize for this. Uh, I have I have three three young kids, all girls actually, and uh, this one is doing this on purpose. I, I will tell you. So please, uh, it is unprofessional. I understand. No, um, it's one. Uh, so I just <laughs> so I just want to um, hit on a couple things for patients that we've talked about, and I think it's really important because um, I think it summarizes stuff before we move on to maybe some Facebook questions that are coming through. So first of all. IBD is a very sort of silent disease. People don't know how sick patients are, and that includes family members. And sometimes that can be very difficult for family members to really appreciate that patients, particularly patients with like very severe Crohn's or UC, really are having a low quality of life from a lack of control of basic body functions, uh, the shame and everything that goes along with that. And actually, you know, just the pain, right? I mean, these things are causing inflammation and damage to your body. Um, and I think the other thing that is important is we've used a lot of professional language, but it's very important for patients to try to understand these concepts and try to find a provider that they feel like really kind of understands them and explains what's going on, maybe in non-professional concepts. Um, Tina, I'm going to pass it on to you for some Facebook Live questions. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Dr. Bishu. And I agree. Um, there are some questions coming in. Um, so um, someone's actually asking about, um, you know, I think someone's pouch was twisted um, and the anastomosis was below the dentate line. So now she has an ostomy. She still has um, the J pouch um, uh, in there. And she wants to know, is there any future recurrence, uh, risk of recurrence of UC or um, pouchitis, or even um, it, does this need to be evaluated for cancer risk in the future? I'm happy for uh, either of you, Dr. Sudha or Kochar, to take this. Yeah, like if you say that the risk of cancer is there or not, uh, the risk is not zero. The risk is there, but the risk is very minimal. Uh, the as such, you know, the, the, the standard policy could be to do an examination called as pouchoscopy a year after doing the J pouch, and we can see the status inside. We have to look at the inflammation in the in the part of the mucosa, which is from the rectum, the residual mucosa, and the rest of the uh, pouch. In case if there are other risk factors like a patient having a, a primary sclerosing cholangitis. Or if the, if the patient had dysplasia before patient underwent surgery, or if there was evidence of cancer earlier, or if there is a family history of cancer, or if a person has a chronic ongoing disease, a long-standing disease before patient underwent surgery. So these are some of the risk factors which puts patient at a relatively high risk of uh, developing a, a kind of tumor in the pouch. But by and large, I will emphasize that the risk is there, but very minimal. So if the risk factors are there, then we have to proceed that after the initial pouchoscopy done at a one year period, we can plan out that the next pouchoscopy examination could be between, you know, varying between three to five years or even longer if, the, if, there's n if none of the risk factor is, uh, is present. But we can't give a total green signal that don't come back to us in case, if, in case if there's no symptoms. So we need to pay, keep a patient under regular monitoring and surveillance as per the you know, presence of various risk factors. 
Yeah, um, I, I agree with Dr. Sood on that. I think <clears throat> it just depends on the indication for the surgery, uh, dysplasia not prior to the pouch creation, and how long is the rectal cuff? That's again a surgeon's skill set, right? Uh, ideally, the rectal cuff should not be longer than one to two centimeter, but if it is four or five centimeter, the risk will depend on that. Um, and, and again, um, it, it won't be a bad idea just to have a pouchoscopy once every two years or three years to look at that cuff and biopsy it, even though it is not in continuation. And the other thing to keep in mind is that longer the pouch remains out of continuity, there is a risk of developing what we call as diversion pouchitis because now you're not getting the stool and the bacteria and probably that goes to your point that you mentioned earlier, that in your second stage, when people have ileostomy and the pouch has been created, they sometimes have mucousy discharge. That's probably some from diversion pouchitis. So I don't think so. It's, a, uh, it, it's unreasonable to do an exam every once or uh, two, three years to look at the cuff. Perfect. Tina, um, yes. We, Tina, I was just saying, we just have, we're about 10 minutes left. So I don't know if you want to just pick the high value questions. And I wanted to give Dr. Sue time to just say a last goodbye being the guest of honor, so to speak. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the questions, and this is coming directly from what you're talking about, um, Dr. Kochar, um, and uh, happy for either of you to answer this as well, is um, the stripping of the cuff. Um, is that something that happens every single time a J-pouch is done, or is that something that just happens when there's cuffitis? I think um, uh, there's uh, patients and clinicians who are interested in this question, so I um, wanted to make sure I brought this up. Yeah. Yes, I, no. Sorry, Simran can take over, please Simran. Yeah. Sure, so, no, no. so I think you're referring to mucosectomy, right? Yes. The technique of mucosectomy, yes. So uh, this goes back to our discussion of stapled anastomosis versus hand sewn. When you do a hand sewn anastomosis, mucosectomy is done at that time. And then the hand sewn anastomosis happens. Uh, in stapled anastomosis, necessarily mucosectomy is not done. Uh, you know, at the time of the surgery. Now, the rationale of mucosectomy uh, is obviously, again, the indication. Is it for dysplasia indication, cancer indication? Then people think mucosectomy should be done. Uh, but in routine ulcerative colitis, J pouches, uh, you know, using stapled anastomosis, they don't do a mucosectomy. That, that makes perfect sense. And then one last question. I think this is coming from a clinician. Um, if a patient needs to use a Medina catheter or aqua flush to empty their pouch, should it, be uh, should it be regarded as a pouch failure or pouch dysfunction? Sorry, use a catheter? No. Yes, to empty their pouch. Yeah, so, so this is a kind of uh, a maternity disorder yes. or dyscasia. Exactly. Yeah. You know, this kind of situation can happen if a person has to you know, hold stool for a long time and uh, a patient gets uh, constipated. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's kind of a functional pouch failure. It, it is one of the manifestations of functional pouch failure where patient can have a symptoms similar to uh, irritable, ball, ir irritable pouch and uh, constipation can be one of the manifestations of this. Right. So I think uh, the use of catheters for evacuation, you have to keep in mind, in mind what Dr. Sood said before about the configuration of pouches. <clears throat> so patient with an S pouch frequently can require self-catheterization to empty. Patients with a Cook pouch or a K pouch, which is a continent ileostomy, yeah. can also require catheterization because the nipple valve can get tight sometimes to evacuate. I would not necessarily call it as a pouch failure uh, because it just depends on the person. You know, there are people who do not want an ileostomy bag and they are fine self-catheterizing themselves. There are patients who even with routine colons, if they have very severe constipation, sometimes require castorization of their own rectum, you know? So it's not uncommon to see the aqua four castor, the castor use. So pouch failure, the term that we define as is when we have to remove the pouch. Now we just have to dive in deeper. Why are these patients doing the castorization? So it's very hard to say, without knowing the patient's A, the configuration of the pouch, uh, what type of pouch they have, and B, how their pouch looks. If they have a very tight structure of the anal canal, and that's why they're self-dilating. You know, some people self-dilate when they have an anal canal stenosis to evacuate, then we can treat the structure endoscopically. I have done many cases of anal structure otomies endoscopically. 
So we can treat that. Um, if there is a functional pouch issue, Dr. Sood mentioned, like a pouch prolapse, in which when you are straining, the interior wall of the pouch, instead of relaxing, it flaps down. So it creates a functional obstruction. So now if you're self-catheterizing for that, then it's a different you know, uh, management issue here. So um, I would not call it just yet as a pouch failure if they're doing it. It just depends why they're doing it. Yeah. Um, absolutely. I, I, sorry, I should have used the word dysfunction rather than failure. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I asked that, so I use the word failure, so that's not on you. But yeah, I, I agree with both of you. I mean, I've had motility issues and I've had to self-catheterize um, my stoma even at times. So it really, uh, I think this really depends on the patient and the patient's situation. That makes sense. Um, uh, Dr. Bishu, you wanted um, Dr. Sood to say a few words to close us up? Yeah, I was wondering, Dr. Sue, we have about five minutes left. If you just want to uh, give a, a, a close and then I'll make a short closing statement. And then I think, I think we're done. Yeah, thank you, Vishu. I think now we discussed pouch. So I just want to emphasize that in the management of uh, IBD, good 70, 80% of the patients, they respond very well to medicines. Surgery should definitely be kept in mind that surgery is an alternative and a good option to those patients who are not responding very well, very well to the medicines. As physician, and uh, we have an important role to explain to the patients about the merits and the demerits of surgery. And because surgery gives good results if done on time and done by a surgeon who is really expert in this. If we let a patient go to a stage where his nutritional status is very poor, or if disease has advanced to a stage of developing complications, or if there are infections, or if we, patient, if we expose the patient to too many immunosuppressive agents, the chances of complications in the form of infections and poorer outcomes after surgery increase. So it's very vital that we have to maintain a right balance between the medicines, because now, you know, with time, different group of different groups of medicines are coming, and more and more medications are coming. So we should not really put a patient on very heavy doses of immunosuppressive therapy. We need to give a, a very balanced approach, and surgery should be done on time. So this is the message, and and I I wish that there are more uh, advocacy groups, there are more support groups like this. Who can, which can really convince a patient, which can, which can raise fears about different kinds of therapies and, uh, and, and about the surgery. So patient support group plays a very, very important uh, role in management of uh, IBD. And I really congratulate all of you and uh, that uh, you are working so much with the patients. And I really express my sincere thanks to you that you, you called me and you gave me a chance to interact with you and the patients. And thank you so much. Thank you. That, that is very kind of you to say, Dr. Sue. Just following up on that, first of all, I want to thank you for your time. I know you are a very busy person. Uh, maybe you have patients right before and then maybe you have patients right after this. So I, I, appreciate, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your time. I really do. Um, and, and just to the listeners, you know, I want to reiterate that Dr. Sue is one of the people who put IBD uh, on the map in India and, and is really an expert. And, and actually everybody on this panel here is, is very much an expert. So Simran is also being quite modest. Uh, Dr. Kochar has a really high value, really high specialized training in, in a very important center. And Cleveland Clinic, um, where he did his last training, is, is really specialized in IBD surgeries, and they have a long history of this, and, and Bo Shen is one of sort of the godfathers of, of pouch therapies, and he's developed like a, a niche market, and definitely considered a rising star uh, in IBD in the United States, if not already a star, uh, and, then, and then Tina, Tina, who um, has been working, I would say, tirelessly for, for patient advocacy and getting her stories out there. And, and I think from a personal perspective, it's really important for her that people in India in particular understand IBD and all, all the cultural issues that come along with that, including marriage um, and all the acceptance and, and everything I think you know somebody like me takes for granted growing up in the United States. Um, and then one last thing, um, I recommend anybody interested uh, both myself, Dr. Kochar um, and Tina, we are all on Twitter. Um, there's also Saya, which is also on Twitter and obviously has Facebook things. So, so please, um, you know, consider sort of getting on that space and, and getting more uh, information. Um, and I think, 
I think that's that's it. So thanks everybody for their time. Thank you. With that I'm gonna say bye. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.